Hello? Hello? Hello, everyone. Take your seats, please. So, welcome. Welcome to the inaugural Hashcorp Meetup. I'm genuinely honoured and impressed to see such a turnout. This is impressive. It speaks, I think, volumes to the HashiCorp tech that we all know and love. Um, so, my name's Daniel Bryant. I'm uh, one of the organisers, along with Cameron at the back there, hiding away. But Cameron, to be fair, did all the heavy lifting. I'm just stealing his credit up here, OK? But um, we are the organisers of the, of the HashiCorp Meetup. We run, uh, work for a company called Open Credo, a consultancy company. We are hiring, so please do check us out if you're interested in working with HashiCorp Tech. We're looking basically with this meetup to share as much as we can on experiences with HashiCorp. So if you've got stories, if you've got sort of cool things you're doing, extensions to Terraform, extensions to the other HashiCorp products, please do reach out to myself, Cameron, any of us from Open Credo actually, and share your story. And then hopefully when we do the meetup, say next month or the month after, you could be up here presenting your ideas. That'd be really cool. So I've got a few thanks. I've got a few notes just to go through. First off, thanks to Sainsbury's for the awesome venue. So a quick round of applause for Sainsbury's for the venue, the pizza, and the beer. Really, really appreciate it. They have actually asked me as well to say they are hiring as well. So it's Open Creed or Sainsbury's. Take your pick on that one. But um, <laughs> what I was going to say is um, we've got a great lineup tonight. We've got Nikki and Brett from uh, Open Credo talking about writing a provider in Terraform. We've got Andrew and Alberto from Just Eat talking about their platform and, and Terraform as well, popular topic. And of course, we're honoured for, for, for Mitchell, Mitchell Hashimoto. I don't know where you are, Mitchell. You're hidden away in the crowd somewhere. Back here. Awesome. The, the founder of, of, co-founder of, of HashiCorp, do presenting, talking about Nomad, which is truly an honour. I know Mitchell has flown in for QCon and also agreed to speak here, which is, is really awesome. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. The rough timing will be, um, we're going to do a talk now, and then another talk straight away. I'll have a break for pizza. And I've been asked to say we can't eat pizza in here. Drinking beers, OK, but no pizza. So we'll go out 15 minutes, grab some pizza, eat, come back, but no food back in here, please, all right? Otherwise, we'll get told off and so forth. And then at 8 o'clock, we'll kick off with Mitchell's talk and end up the night around 8.45, 9 o'clock. So that's it. So without further ado, I'll introduce my colleague, Nikki, to talk. Okay, well, welcome everybody. So my name is Nikki Watt and this is Brett Mack and we're going to be talking to you today about uh, building a Terraform provider and using VCD as an example. So really quickly who we are, so we're a hands-on hands -on tech consulting company. Uh, we work with a variety of different clients, um, quite a lot in the sort of DevOps space and many of our clients make use of HashiCorp products and we're actually really proud as well to be system integration providers. Partners, sorry. Um, one of the projects that we're working on is a cloud automation project with the government. And one of the key features that they are looking for in this particular project is how do you go about creating secure, self-contained environments in different clouds? So for example, if you have a developer who wants to spin up an environment to do some testing, spin it up in Amazon or spin it up in Azure or some other cloud provider, how do you go about doing that? Um, there's, quite a few uh, there's quite a few HashiCorp products that are actually used in this particular project, but it's also the project that actually gave birth to the VCD provider, which Brett is going to do the majority of the talking uh, about today. So, the agenda, really quickly, I'm going to do a Terraform introduction, and then Brett is going to talk about the VCD provider and building a generic Terraform provider. So, really quickly, show of hands, who's actually used Terraform or is actively using Terraform? Okay, so a fair number of you. So, this is the super quick introduction to Terraform. So Terraform, for those of you who don't know, is a way to basically create, manage, and manipulate infrastructure resources. Um, you do this by defining resources in one or more files, and this pretty much describes the target architecture in your cloud that you're trying to create. You then point Terraform at these files, and when it gets applied, it takes the definitions that you've created, and it creates the physical uh, infrastructure resources in the cloud and starts costing you money. These, <laughs> um, it's also not just a one-off creation tool though. So it's not that you just create it to, do the, um, to create your VMs for the first time. You can also do it to manage your infrastructure. So let's say, for example, you started with five machines, and then you decide, well, actually, I want 10. You can change your definition in your Terraform file have Terraform reapply it for you, and it will then basically create 10 machines. It can also do things like diffs, so it can say, well, uh, this is what you've asked me to do. The cloud provider's only got five. I'm going to create five machines for you. Do you really want me to go ahead? 
So it gives you control to be able to deal with that. One of Terraform's key selling points, though, is that it can handle multiple different cloud providers. So as opposed to maybe if you're just in Amazon using something like CloudFormation or if you were doing something in OpenStack, you might use Heat, you can actually use Terraform to define your infrastructure for both of these cloud providers. And it's also not just cloud providers. So you can use things, you can connect to things like PaaS, things like Heroku and Cloud Foundry, and also software as a service type offerings. So maybe you have a DNS provider that you also want to integrate with. You can do all of this in one place in your Terraform files. Out of the box, Terraform supports pretty much uh, all of the major cloud providers as well as uh, quite a few others. But another one of its key selling points is that it has a pluggable provider architecture. And pretty much what I mean by that is that, you know, if the cloud provider out there uh, isn't currently available in Terraform, it, Terraform has a wonderful way of giving you an approach and a framework to allow you to build it. And that's pretty much what we've done with the VCD provider. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Brett, who's going to give you all the good details about that. Thank you, Nikki. Is this on? OK. So I'm going to speak about developing a Terraform provider. Um, and I'm going to use BCD uh, as my, my main point. So what is? a provider plugin. Terraform is written in such a way that it's plugin centric. Every cloud provider that um, it will deal with is written as a plugin. This makes it really versatile and very easy to develop for. Some of the cloud providers currently, are, sorry, some of the providers currently out there are listed here. Now this list has grown really, really quickly. Uh, when I was first working with Terraform, there was less than half. So chances are, if it's not supported, it will be very soon. This talk is going to mainly concentrate on the VMware vCloud Director, um, because we at OpenCreate wrote that. I think if I spoke about creating the AWS provider, Mitchell would have something to say. So the first thing you want to do when creating a telephone provider is work out what it is you want to control. That seems really simple. But too often, you go into something and you see everything that your cloud provider can support. And you try to, you try to implement it all. That's going to take ages. You're going to get bored. You're going to give up. Also, even if you only want to support a very few amount of features, your issue is not going to be unique to you. Lots of people are going to want to do the same thing. So if you can quickly get that out, other people will be happy that they'll be using what you've written. Also, you need to remember that open source community projects grow naturally. As soon as something is out there, people will contribute, people will work on top of what you've done. So in defining what we want to control, for us, it was, I want to spin up some VMs, and I want to control what ports are available externally. So if this was Amazon, I'd be looking at an EC2 resource and um, a security group resource. However, in VCD, it was not quite that simple. So this is a, a typical vCloud director architecture. You have the internet. And from there, the th first thing you come into is an edge gateway. Now, your hosting provider will give that to you. You can't control that. That's part of, part of what you're given. However, from there, things get routed to an internal network, rules are applied, and you finally get down to a VR. So what we need to work on is this. So like I said, we wanted to create a VM. In vCloud Director, that's defined as a VM. So EC2 would uh, be the same kind of thing. But when a VM is created, it does not get an external IP address. That VApp cannot communicate with any other VApps, and it can't communicate with the internet. In order to do that, it needs to be connected to internal network. So that's another resource we need to write. Now, you're going to have multiple VApps all using the same external IP now. 
So in order to route things through to the right V app, you need to create destination map. So now our two resources are now four resources. And lastly, for them to be able to connect outside to the internet, they need a source map. So our two resources are now five resources. Now we know what it is that we want to create, we need to look at core Terraform provider concepts. First of all, you create a file, a provider file. Now, this is going to be the core. Right here, you define what it, or how it is. You make an API connection to the hosting provider you want to work with. What resources this provider will support. And that brings us on to resources. So like we said a minute ago, there are five resources we need to, need to work with. So we're going to have to create five separate files, five functions, and we need to put that in, say in the provider what they are. Now, once you have your provider and your resources, both of these are defined with schema. So schema is going to be your user-defined attributes that you're, you can accept, or maybe attributes uh, supplied back to you by your API. Once you have that, you wrap everything in a plugin. This is really easy with Terraform. It's three lines of code to wrap everything you have and create a binary. Now, it's important to remember that everything in Terraform is its own binary file. The way Terraform works with these binaries is if we look at our Terraform VM, really small file, um, when it sees provider VCD, Terraform is going to launch the provider binary that you've created. When that binary launches, it's going to look at the preferred method of communication for the operating system it's running on. Now, on Windows, that's going to be opening a port and telling Terraform, you can communicate with me on this port. Uh, for Mac and Linux, you're going to get a domain socket. Once it's worked that out and opened that method of communication, it gives that info back to Terraform. And from then on, any time a resource needs that binary, it will use the communication method given to it. So now we have the core concepts, and we know what we want to do. How do these map? So taking our diagram from earlier, we have a plugin. A plugin is going to be for vCloud Director, the whole thing. Resources are your individual com uh, components, which you can control. And then your schema are contract defining rules when interacting with these resources. So let's look at the schema that we needed for a provider. On VCD, to connect, I needed to hand over a user, password, org, a URL, and a VDC. Now, a VDC is just a, a virtual data center. Um, the last three of those, well, actually all of those, are going to be given to you by, uh, by your hosting provider. So let's look at an individual schema. User, for example. So when defining a schema, you're not just saying a field that you expect. You have to describe that field. So we have value type, description, default value, and possible flags. Now, these flags can be optional, required, computed, or false new. The last two are mainly going to be used for defining resource schema. Um, as computed means this is something that my hosting provider's API is going to give back to me. And false new says, if this changes, destroy what's there, create it again. It's not something that can be updated. So in the case of our user, we have value type as type string, description, VCD username, and required is true. We can't actually try to make a connection unless this has been provided. When looking at resources, as I described before, we want network, the app, firewall rules, destination map, and source map. 
each of these resources, in, as well as having schema, will also define how they do standard CRUD operations. Each of these are required other than update. If you have defined your resource schema with every field being force new, you have said there's nothing that can be updated. So you don't need to provide an update function. But Terraform provides one more. Exists. Exists. <laughs> Exists allows you to check that what you're trying to create isn't already there on your, on your hosting provider. Because what you need to remember is Terraform may not be controlling every single resource you have in that hosting provider. People can create things manually. Maybe you're using another tool to create them. And you don't want Terraform to, to try and overwrite that to fail with an error. So let's have a look at how we would define this in Go. So this is a provider, as we mentioned earlier. You have a string of schema. And here we show user, password. Once again, both of them are of type string. They're both required. And we have a short description. After schema, you create a resources map. So these are the resources that this provider should handle. It's a standard map with a string, and then the function that we're going to call if this resource is used. Some of the issues you may encounter when writing this is not every hosting provider will have a standard REST uh, API. You may have things that you can't update, um, which was actually our case. So we were trying to work with firewall rules. Um, and VCD allows you to create, delete, nothing else. If you try to, if you try to update, it's just going to recreate. One of the things you need to remember here is this is all written in Go. This is a really, really good programming language. If you need to do extra logic manipulation, you can do that before you send anything onto your cloud provider. In conclusion, writing a Terraform provider is really simple. The framework is there. Everything is well documented. And there's already lots of community code. It's very easy to read through. Also, don't let Go put you off. Even if you're not a Go developer, it is very, very easy to, to pick up and very hard to master. Uh, and also, the, the community support is great. As soon as you get something out there, you're going to have people helping you, working with you. Um, and the HashiCorp guys gave me so much guidance when I first issued my pull request. So thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> So if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to send the mic round. We got like, do we take? So um, just in case other people don't know, vCloud has a concept of a template and a catalog, um, but you didn't mention that in part of your model of a vApp. So what, what, how are you are running a, a virtual machine or a vApp when you aren't um, okay, caring about so those things? I try to keep it fairly high level. If you look at the, um, the documentation, um, the vapp when you describe it in terraform you actually say where the catalog is and what the um the vapp template is that you're hoping to call it won't create those any more questions any more great talk um how do you go about testing your provider plugin good question um <laughs> Terraform makes it quite easy uh, to test um, your Terraform provider. What you would write, you don't actually write unit tests. Everything is an acceptance test. Um, and they have provided a really good framework for doing that. So one of the things you do when you write your provider plugin is you allow a default function to get your values. This allows you to write code and test it without having to upload your credentials. because. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Um, so that is a really quick framework, um, but it, all is, it is all acceptance. 
So you can only run tests on something you can communicate with. But that was beyond this talk, it's right there. It's very, it makes it very, very easy. You just say a test resource that you want to create, and then you test that that resource is as you have defined it. While I'm looking, Brett, I'll just ask you, now that you've written one provider, do you think it'd be much easier to write another one? Yes. Um, we've actually started working on another one. Anyone else still? If not, I think, thank you very much, Brett thank and you. Nikki. Thank you. <laughs>just eat. So hopefully some of you have heard of us. Maybe. Cool. So today is actually the 10th anniversary of Just Eat started in the UK. So we've been around for 10 years apparently. Um, it's come a long way in those 10 years. And uh, yeah, so we now operate in 13 markets around the globe. And uh, I've been told I can say this. Uh, so on average, we can process two and a half thousand orders per minute which uh, is a lot of food, I think. Um, so one of the main factors of Just Eat is that we need to get our site needs to be responsive and get the food to our customers. 
uh, when they want it. Um, no one wants cold food, no one wants it an hour late. So we need a platform that is resilient uh, and scalable. So about four years ago, slightly before my time, um, just decided to migrate to AWS, so Amazon Web Services. Um, I think this is a decision that they very glad they took, and it's allowed them to expand over those uh, following four years um, to the point now where we run um, hundreds of instances uh, at peak. So we have a lot of daily scaling to match demand. People tend to like to eat at certain times of the day, and then we have to react to that and make sure we have enough uh, capacity for that. And one of, the, one of the decisions that they took was to heavily use uh, CloudFormation. So hopefully some of you are aware of AWS and CloudFormation. Um, just allows you to uh, basically script out uh, an entire feature, uh, how you want it to deploy, all of the resources. Um, and we actually do this for every feature for Just Eat. Um, so AWS setup, we have lots of AWS accounts. Um, we have multiple production, multiple QA accounts. Um, every day we launch and tear down all of our QA environments. Um, I guess this makes it cost effective, also guarantees that your QA environment is all up to date. Um, and then the last point there, just, just to say that on average an instance is less than three days old. Um, due to the scaling and the teardown, it means that our environment is usually quite recent, it's up to date. Um, so that means that we need a, a system of configuration that is also going to be up to date. So before console. So I'd like to point out that console is a great product, um, centralized configuration service discovery. Uh, what we had before this wasn't terrible. Um, in no way am I blaming anyone that worked at Just Eat before me. Um, <laughs> but I was told console's great, so I started to look into it. Um, so before some of our features, we would have, for the configuration that a feature would have, so we're predominantly .NET running on Windows boxes, um, and the config configuration would be in a JSON file. So during bootstrapping via CloudFormation, we would have scripts that would generate this configuration as it went. So this has a lot of benefits that we could template some of our configuration, um, but it also had some drawbacks in the fact that we were heavily reliant on those scripts that generated the config uh, to always work. Um, if there's something wrong with those, it would impact QA, possibly production. Um, yeah, so. Another use that we had was settings. We had a feature called settings API. Um, we have key values that are stored in DynamoDB, which is an AWS uh, database service that's offered. And again, this, this data was critical for some of our portions. We use it for uh, AWS region failover if we need to change the region that we're in within AWS. And I think although it is working very well, um, it requires a task that goes along and says, what's your latest value? What's your latest value? Has it changed? And from a configuration point of view, not ideal. And service discovery. So I've put a slight question mark at the end of that because we don't really discover services so much. We have uh, using Route 53 in AWS, we advertise a DNS endpoint which points to the elastic load balancer that all of our instances, that elastic load balancer per feature, the instances for the feature sit behind it, and then route traffic to it. Um, I guess one of the main drawbacks of this is we need a health check to ensure that instance stays within the ELB. That health check is quite generic, um, doesn't really tell us much about what's going on. Um, yeah, and a few hard-coded IPs, which are not great, especially in the cloud. Um, so we started moving to console in late 2015. So we're probably quite late adopters to a lot of the people in the room. Um, so we set it up with a console cluster per environment. Um, we did this, I think, yeah, seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, so we have all of our JSON config is now stored in GitHub as it was before, but it's in a heavily templated format. Um, we have generators that run via TeamCity to generate the config as we go. This config then gets recommitted back to GitHub in a separate repository. That repository is then polled by Git to console, which then seeds all of that configuration to console. So I guess the advantage of this, because we tear down all our environments daily, 
that every morning when we spin up a console cluster, it can read from con configuration that's already generated. Uh, the other benefit is that the configuration generator has a lot of tests, a lot of validation. Uh, it can hopefully uh, remove bad config. It gets flagged up quite early on. And there's also notifications and permissions and around when configuration can be changed. Um, how does that look? It's quite big. Um, so we have three console servers sitting behind an ELB, traditionally with Git console box. This is all on Linux. Uh, that's polling GitHub, which is hosted internally. And then all of the features that we launch, every single instance that we launched is then connected to the ELB. So we're still adopting this as we roll it out across all of our platforms. But this is literally hundreds, hundreds of instances now connecting to console daily. Uh, and then just an example, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, key value storage, just some of the kind of points that we have. So every single agent, uh, every single instance runs console agent, then takes a local copy of all the key values, um, which can then store and access to generate the config. So now that we've introduced console, every instance gets launched, joins console cluster for its environment. Uh, this is all during the deployment steps. Um, it advertises its uh, service that it's running. Uh, the service at the moment is just the health check and the console check itself, uh, but we have plans to uh, increase the, the awareness of all the service discovery portions of console. Um, and we also have console template, so this runs on the box that registers, uh, watches the key values, and then generates the, the, the web config, the app config, some connection strings. Um, the benefits of this, so now we no longer have to cycle instances to change configuration. So before it was generated during deployment, all of the config was held within the package. Um, if we needed to change those values, we'd have to change it in source control, generate another package, make a release, cycle the instances. Seems a lot of work just to change some config values. Um, so I put in there seconds versus minutes because that is literally just change what's in source control, generator runs, commits it back to GitHub, seeds it to console, and existing instances will then get the latest configuration. Um, I think this is quite a, uh, a big change for how we manage configuration and it will give us a lot more opportunity to, to change those settings. Uh, <coughs> other benefits of console, cons consistent config. Um, yeah, you make a change, it, it immediately gets rolled out to, to console and all instances then pick that up. Um, there's no more sort of half and half. If we did a release and we scaled up, we'd have half on some values. Uh, the old data, some on the new data. So this, this is consistent. You make a change and, and it sticks. And, uh, and then, of course, is the UI, which is okay. Uh, the UI is it's clear, it's informative. Um, it gives a, a great view of platform health, uh, the overview, uh, and, of course, the option to drill into the services and actually see what's going on with those instances. Uh, you can do this via AWS, but I don't think it's, uh, it's as informative or clear. So another use that we've found for console is another console cluster. So we've kind of called it platform console cluster. So this is holding all of the metadata within uh, Just Eat. So the metadata is generated in a similar method. We have JSON files with uh, templated with overrides for environments. The data gets generated, committed to the repo, which is then seeded to console. So this is... So I put powering other tools in Just Eat. So this is now becoming the source of truth. Um, we have many formats and many sources at the moment, uh, which isn't always good. And we're building on this to try and get as much data in there as possible. Um, we have a, a Nugget package that instances get deployed with that then ha have access to this. Um, so there's a little bit less um, of trying to work out where data is. And it also keeps all the data up to date. If you need to make a change, uh, an example would be you need to add a new environment. You add it to the metadata. And then all the other features will then start generating configuration for that environment automatically. So it's, um, yeah, it's working out. 
And finally, Packer. So I've only given Packer one slide. Um, it probably deserves more than that. It's a fantastic tool. Um, yeah, so we've, it has all of our dependencies pre-installed. Um, and because of that, it's allowed us to reduce our cloud formation. So we have lots of cloud formation, a lot of it templated, but we have a lot of features that don't always conform. Um, for example, the most recent feature that we've baked, um, we removed just over 500 lines of JSON, uh, which is pretty good. Um, I mean, the, the benefits we have now of baking AMIs is that the deployment time is significantly reduced because we no longer have to go out and get all of the dependencies, download them. There's no issues around uh, rate limiting. Because we launch so many instances at once, are we uh, hitting the same bucket? Um, all of those problems have gone away. Um, it also gives an extra level of validation of our AMIs. We can iterate and make small changes, and this has allowed us to work faster. And we also, I think, used to have compliance on there. So compliance, we know exactly what's running on all of our AMIs now. It's no longer, this AMI works with this feature. Can you share it with all these accounts? It's like we can generate these from scratch repeatedly, consistently. Um, I think this made a big change to Just Eat. And finally, the, um, the ID that we generate when we bake is then pushed to console. So now, if something's launching, if it's a, a web worker, then you can just say, I'm a web worker, go and give me the latest AMI. And it has no concept of AMI IDs. Um, so that's less configuration. Cool. And then quickly, Alberto. Um, uh, my name is Alberto. Um, yeah, we work for, uh, for Just Eat. Uh, Andy has did a great introduction for Just Eat. And uh, my department is Acquire Platforms. So, um, yeah, um, Acquire Platforms, what we do in Acquire Platforms. Yeah, you may, you, you're right, yeah, we're correct. We Acquire Platforms, uh, absolutely. <laughs> and, of course, we, we also uh, look after them, too. So, um, in our daily, in our work, we can handle, yeah, all this, all this thing. So when we acquire a platform, we AWS, obviously, Azure, all, all this, it's all this. So we, we decided we don't want to be tied to a, a specific cloud provider. So you, you guess which our preferred tool from HashiCorp, of course. Yeah, that's sure, yeah. <laughs> so um, also we use Vagrant and Console in a, in a in less, Yes, um, a more or less background. Basically, to we want to create the environment for our developers to run and to develop locally, and console basically for config. Uh, we, we can use we, we, we can use it for uh, service discovery and other, but basically mostly for config for configuration and config propagation. Uh, that's right. So what I'm, going, I'm here basically to 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 tell here some stories and use cases ab about uh, what we like at Terraform. And, uh, and, and why we are interested, so we are so much interested in it. So this is what we value uh, most from Terraform. Of course, we provide us an abstraction layer for us. So we, we don't carry the infrastructure. We don't go to the console and look for the data. We rely on, on Terraform and doing that. Carry, uh, uh, Terraform will carry the infrastructure for us. Um, uh, obviously, uh, we, we version the infrastructure, which is a very great, as you may think, we, when we acquire a platform, there's no uh, cloud formation. Probably we acquire an AWS one, there's no cloud formation at all, and we want to version it. And that's very good. So we, we, cannot, we cannot go and even cloud agnostic. So that's a common language also for describe all our resources. This, uh, that's uh, very good. So we speak the same language. And also we let Terraform do its job in this life cycle when we deploy, which is, um, yeah, we, we man, um, we can do also with Terraform's rollbacks and be safe, stay in the safe side. Uh, also, the dependency resolution um, in all the, in the very big um, uh, schema, so we don't care about who goes first. Terraform will take care of all of that. So in acquired platforms, uh, we, we, acquire, we start from scratch normally. So you may think that we acquire a platform, and that's brownfield. So you, you, are, you are having something done. Yeah, but we want to improve it. We want to make it scalable. We want to make it 
better. So we, we want to keep releasing features. So that's in, uh, well, I would say that's Greenfield. So we, we have to, in a brownfield, you, uh, you have to grow flowers, basically. And um, so we care about the three S's in a, in a Cred Platforms team. We care about the stability, scalability, and security of the platform. And of, obviously in the cloud. And we want to keep releasing. We want to keep releasing features. We want to monitor them properly. So <coughs> what we can, we, we need something in place. We need, obviously we need something that we can put in there and we can, our developers in that platform, we can deploy things easily. And it's, we want to want to reinvent the wheel in every platform, regardless of the cloud, from the cloud provider we have. Regardless, that's the, our decision. Our decision. We, de we decided we don't want to go to be tied to Azure, AWS, or DigitalOcean. So we need we need a uh, uh, easy reproducible pipeline, uh, as much as uh, cloud agnostic as we can, using Terraform as the base. Okay, we are tied in acquired platforms. We are tied to the technology of the platform, not for the provider. So we want to be able even to replicate to other providers. So yeah, here we go. So, so some of the list of the things: PHP, Java, um, Go, of course, um, some Node, um, Apache engines, uh, all the usual um, monitoring stuff, ELKs, uh, um, Logly, that's right. Some Essential, New Relic for monitoring. So we want to keep this in place. So uh, what we did, uh, what we have in place, is a uh, pipeline and how we deal with it. So we always start from source control. So we have our, our infrastructure is start from, from GitHub, our source control. That's a base infrastructure. So we always do Terraform play. We do, we increment the thing. We, we put the things uh, incremental. We, that's the potency of Terraform. Yeah, no, normal things like network subnets, all the stuff that doesn't change so much. All the things are stable and that's the base for all the thing comes in, in top of it. Neighbor ACLs, main databases, of course, and if we need to scale that, then we execute Terraform again. So if we have to move a big database to our M3 to R3, we execute Terraform and Terraform will take care of that. Uh, probably uh, having a snapshot and things like that, of course. <coughs> so um, yeah, um, also in that, in that uh, base infrastructure, uh, we spawn a console for config. It's all fitted into it, and for the upper stages, we'll handle the TF state. So then we have the moving infrastructure in, our, in that pipeline. That moving infrastructure will, normally we use Jenkins, which is quite good orchestrator, and we, it's standalone. So for, for now, for us, that's the job. But basically what, what uh, Jenkins does is execute Terraform again. So again, starting from source control, we have our moving part and describe our instances, the auto scaling groups, provisioning, um, yeah, all the artifacts, uh, all is defined in there. Um, we bake. We, um, the, the idea of the, how, how we, that we, our ideal world is to bake those instances into an, yeah, in this case, will be a AWS AMI into a disk image so um, that artifact, uh, of course, this is a very good place to put Packer in it. So yes, we, we are considering it, absolutely. And then we rely on the modules to get all the all needed stuff, all the uh, monitoring and alerting, login thing, yeah, all the common things. We only have to invoke it. We let Terraform to do the job. That's it. So we're, we're very happy in that. So here are our tools. So normally we use uh, Terraform as the base, of course. Um, Ansible for provisioning the instances. Capistrano for some deployments. Uh, it's, uh, it's a Ruby uh, tool, so we can roll back in some cases. Uh, the console uh, is for config propagation and in the upper stages to save the state file for Terraform and background for local develop development. We accustom our developers to develop in the background box and then push everything into source control. And yeah, Jenkins for orchestration. Yeah, it's for now, that's the job. Uh, probably we'll consider something in the future. And in our team, we are considering, yeah, more HashiCorp to come. So yeah, as I said before, Packer, is one of the, of course, we want to pack the thing, use Packer. And we, Vault for secrets, yeah, um, absolutely. Right now we use Enansible Vault, uh, but we like the idea of Vault having in the cluster and yeah, the things, everything again propagated and templating 
uh, absolutely, that's right. So, so there's some you know, some stories about acquired platforms. So, any questions to me or to Andy? Um, I mean, Andy, this is more directed at you, I think. You mentioned Vault in your second talk, but you said you mainly use console for configuration. Um, was it a conscious choice not to use Vault? Because obviously it offers a lot more insecurity than console does. Um, so it wasn't a conscious choice not to use it. Um, we're still in the early days of adoption for console. Um, uh, yeah, we will be moving to Vault, absolutely. Um, that's a question for Alberto. Um, about the TF state, you mentioned that you are using console instead of S3. What were the benefits on that? Because effectively you are on S3, you don't need to care about the backing it up, I guess. Yeah. And then with console, you need to back up JawKeeper, I guess. And I oh know, so ATCD and, and well, the console storage system. Yeah. Um, well, the thing is, so, um, I, I saw this is very easy to configure as the same in S3. Uh, currently, not a bunch is more especially. Um, the thing is, uh, it's all fitted in the same infrastructure. Uh, we usually, uh, before using S3 bucket, that's the job it, again. Uh, for, for us, particularly, no specific um, mm, advantage on that. But yeah, um, it's, it's because you unify everything. Everything locks into console for configuration and for handling things. Basically, more for unifying. Final question. I saw the hand at the back there. Uh, yeah, with uh, with console, when you, uh, you when you're saying you're de deploying uh, new console changes, how does your application know that con uh, console has been updated, and how does it does it use hot reloading or something like that? How does it um, without doing a new deployment? Uh, so using uh, console template, which so the console template is then fixated on the the key values, which then will uh, update the web and app config. So. Okay, but how do, so. Do the application know that the change has happened and then reloads with the new config? Uh, no, they don't. So they'll just carry on and just use the latest version. Right, OK. Right, I think that's all we've got time for. Please join me in thanking Andrew and Alberto for a great talk there. <laughs> it, 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 go, it does go without saying that everyone is hiring here tonight pretty much, yeah? Uh, so anyway, uh, Cameron's just informed me. Um, please go have some pizza, have some beers, have some chat. Uh, back in here at 10.30.